So I, it's a great pleasure to talk in this uh, celebration of Arthur Ogus's uh, 70th birthday. Uh, I'm honored to be asked to, to talk. Um, what I want to talk about, if I see the chalk, ah, there's the chalk. Uh, no, that's the colored chalk. I don't need the colored chalk. Yeah, that's the, that's, that will do. That was the water bottle. It's okay. I don't need the water bottle. So um, this is, uh, first of all, <laughs> credit where credit is due. It's joint work with uh, Jose Burgos Gil. <coughs> and <coughs> Javier Frezan. And Omid uh, Amini. Uh, Um, and also, um, it grows out of conversations I had with uh, the physicists, in particular uh, Pierre Van Hove uh, and his, uh, uh, his <coughs> then student, uh, uh, Pyotr Turkin. And um, uh, one other source of inspiration, sometimes for me the most significant, uh, is a series over the years, really, of conversations uh, with Professor uh, Kato. Uh, and he has undertaken graciously to explain to me the program uh, he and his collaborators uh, have undertaken over it's a massive program over, over some years, to understand uh, degenerations of Hodge structures. And it's a, it's a very subtle and difficult uh, business. Um, and everything I'm going to say is, in some sense, known either to these guys or, or to these guys. Um, but our attempt is to sort of uh, bring uh, these guys, by and large, don't know these guys. And so we, we want to sort of uh, bring together the, uh, the various schools. And in particular, the, the massive and, and, and subtle program of Kato and collaborators uh, yields many, many, many uh, uh, invariants associated to degenerations of hot structures. But only some of them are of interest. And so, Wait. sorry? So, no, I, no I, I, think it's, I, I think even Professor Kato, he's, he's probably here, so he could testify, but I think he would even admit that, that some of them are really artifacts of the external structure you put on hard structures, and others are completely fascinating related to uh, regulators and relating to physics. So anyway, let me uh, proceed. What are... Uh, Amplitudes, see I wrote down a list of things I want to say here. Yeah, so um, the point is that, well, yeah, let me say something about how a mathematician attacks physics to begin with. So we have to set level here. Um, there's a story I like to tell. Uh, when my grandson was four, he was interested in trains. And so Christmas came and I bought him a train set. And the train set came in this massive box. And it was immediately clear that I made a big mistake. The, the train set was much too complicated for the kid and too subtle. And he could make no sense out of all the complicated pieces. And I thought, oh dear, Christmas is ruined. Uh, he will be miserable. But not at all. Because in fact, what happened was even though the train set was too intricate and complicated and subtle and, and everything, uh, the box was fantastic, <laughs> with, with the wonderful pictures of trains doing all these exciting things. And so the whole day was passed in sort of fantasy play with the box. <laughs> and I think there's a lesson there for mathematics. Uh, uh, you can't, it's not possible. Physics is too hard for anyone but the dedicated professional physicist to, to really deal with. On the other hand, physics involves these structures, which are completely fascinating uh, mathematically. 
And I, that's, it's with that spirit that I, that I want to uh, proceed. So OK, so what is, what is uh, I want to talk about uh, quantum field theory. And um, quantum field theory very typically kind of begins with, a, with a, uh, really a metaphor. And this metaphor is what they call the path integral. And it's, uh, it's a big infinite dimensional integral that nobody really knows how to uh, attack. And um, so there's been developed uh, one school of, uh, one way to attack it is a so-called perturbative uh, way. And this is based on the uh, expansion, a sort of expansion which is, again, inspired by the finite dimensional <laughs> case. And it's ex an expansion over um, where the index set is a certain collection of graphs. So I write gamma for a graph or for a collection of graphs. Um, and so for each graph, there is a, a coefficient alpha, gamma, and then uh, there is a, um, uh, I don't know, variable, um, which is raised to the power, which is the first homology group, the, 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 the rank of the first homology group of gamma. So that, that's sort of the, the basic shape. And we are interested in alpha, gamma. This is the so-called amplitude. So um, now we're going to cheat, uh, because in fact, we're going to write down some integral. We're going to write down a number of integrals for alpha gamma. And by and large, none of them are going to converge. But we won't worry about that, because I, I won't make any assertion. I mean, there are ways of regularizing and renormalizing these integrals, but that's not our, our project. We just want to understand the integrals themselves. Okay? And in particular, we want to understand the integrand. So let me begin by writing down four uh, different ways uh, to, uh, to understand this, this alpha gamma. Let's see if I can get it straight. And bear in mind that I'm writing down things that don't make any sense, that is to say that don't converge. OK, so let's see. The first way, um, let me change notation here. Stick with my notes. I call this capital A. OK, so the first way would write capital A gamma as an integral. Oh, uh, one thing here, um, we fix uh, an integer capital D, which will be the dimension of space-time. So R to the D is space-time. Okay. And we, uh, we give it the... Um, uh, the Minkowski <coughs> metric. So in other words, x1 squared minus the sum from 2 up to d of xi squared. Okay. So um, then what we, um, the first expression for the amplitude associated to a graph of gamma is an integral over, oh, I, I'll also write uh, you just gen general notation. If I have a graph gamma, I'll write G for the homology, the rank of the, the number of loops, right, the loop number of, of gamma. So then it, the first expression is uh, uh, R to D times G, that's the domain of integration, and then uh, we take the, um, the following thing. We take the product over all the edges in gamma. So E, e of gamma is a set of edges. Uh, of uh, a certain propagator which I'll label P sub E. And the P sub E's are um, quadrics. Um, so bottom line is we, we get a, a, a rational integral 
But you see, depending upon the various values of g and d, uh, each of these things has degree 2. So at infinity, I mean, you, you can see the, the, the possibility for divergence and all, all kinds of uh, complicated things can happen. But at least as, a, as an integrand, that, that makes uh, perfect sense. Uh, let me take a minute to say this a slightly different way. If we want to write down the homology of the graph, we know we have a, a little exact sequence, let's say with real coefficients, then we can take uh, here the direct sum of, oh, let me take R D coefficient. So. And then here we can take the direct sum of R D uh, over E, um, over the edges. And then here um, we can, let me write it vertically, we can take the boundary map to the direct sum over the vertices, so V of gamma, so E is the edges, and V of gamma will be the vertices. Okay. And again, we have R D, but uh, we have to put a little constraint here. We put a little zero because we know that the boundary, this is the, just the topological, these are just little um, segments, and we here this is the boundary, the two endpoints of the, of the segment, and we know that the, the resulting element here, the, the coefficients sum to zero, so I put a zero here. Um, and um, here we have various, um, I'll, I'll put a, we have various uh, projectors, uh, which I'll just denote by E dual. So if I take an edge little e, I can project this direct sum onto that particular uh, that particular factor. And then here I can take my uh, Minkowski uh, my Minkowski metric, and that gives me a map to R. Okay. So I get then for each edge, I get then a function on this vector space, and I can then restrict those functions to the fiber over a given, yeah, so now it comes in an important uh, additional um, structure. I give myself inside here a point in this big vector space, which I call P, and this is the collection of external, what's called external Momenta. Okay. And so I basically can rewrite this integral as an integral over the inverse image of a given external momentum. So this depends, in other words, on a choice of external momentum. So here I should make this a, depends on external momentum of. Um, this uh, d, d, g of x, and then again the product of these p e, where p e now is this this function. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's, let's assume that gamma gamma is connected. Okay, so that's uh, the first expression for the amplitude. Um, but there's some others. Let's see, if I shoot this really far. Then the second one um, so I call it two. A gamma. There's a factor here. I think it's n minus one factorial. Where I write n for the number of edges of, of gamma. So n will be a fixed notation. And then I'll also write sigma. It will play an important role. Is a is a, a simplex. Uh, so it's the set of all. Uh, so it will be contained in 
P, I'll take a projective space of dimension n minus 1, which I'll think of as having homogeneous coordinates labeled by the edges. So they're n edges, and so the corresponding projective space is dimension n minus 1, and sigma will simply be the locus, simply be the locus where all the TEs are non-negative. Of course, one of them at least has to be non-zero, right? because it's a projective point. Okay. Is this where the real Grassmannian comes in? Uh, the real Grassmannian, you, you thank your lucky stars, doesn't come in. Uh, <laughs> but if it were to come in, it would come in here. Yes. Yes. Um, anyway, the, the second expression then becomes an integral over R dg cross sigma, a sort of product uh, chain. And here we have d dg x. And then we have omega. So I'll write omega for the, the standard integration form of integration on projective space. It's, 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 not, it's not really a form on projective space. It's, it's sort of because the homogeneity doesn't work. So it's a sum over plus or minus. I'll have TE and then I'll have DTE1 wedge, DTE leave out wedge, DTE n. So the standard form. So I put this omega here, and then to, to make the homogeneity work, I take downstairs, I take the sum, I take the universal uh, quadric. So those PEs were quadrics, so I take the sum uh, indexed or labeled or multiplied by the homogeneous coordinates, PE. And I raise it to the appropriate power, which is just n. Okay. Now the passage between these various uh, integrals is done by sort of standard, standard tricks, and these standard tricks, depending upon the graph, are probably completely illegal because they involve exchanging orders of integration uh, in divergent situations. So, so you have to be very careful about, uh, about that. But uh, just again, to just see the shape of the integrand, we're not going to worry. So the third guy involves uh, some extra uh, data, which we'll need to work with. Uh, and so it has the following shape, A gamma, again, um, will be a certain constant, which I've written down here, but I do not guarantee that I've got it right, um, over, again, it's n minus 1 factorial. And now we just have an integral over sigma. And here come two polynomials, the so-called first and second semantic polynomials. So the first semantic I call psi. It gets raised to a power which, if if I've got it right, is n minus g plus 1 uh, times d uh, over 2, uh, again, times this uh, form, this integration form omega, uh, divided by the so-called second semantic polynomial. So I call that phi gamma. And that raised to the power n minus uh, g d over 2. Uh, and that's it. All right, so here, psi is the first semantic. And uh, phi is the second semantic. OK. Um, and I have to tell you what those things are, but, but let, let me postpone that for a minute. Uh, notice that 2 and 3 really are live, an algebraic geometer is comfortable with these because they're rational, uh, rational forms and we're integrating over certain chains. And so if the answer makes any sense, it should be a period, uh, the, the kind of thing that uh, one is used to dealing with. Uh, the fourth expression is something that uh, a physicist was comfortable with. Um, uh, it's a sort of a toy, um, uh, what's, well, uh, let me write it down, you, you'll see 
what I mean. Uh, it's 1 over, again, there's a constant, which I don't guarantee, but I seem to have written 4 pi squared i to the whole thing to the gth power. And now I have an integral, but now I take sigma twiddle, so I should say, I told you what sigma was. Sigma twiddle is sort of the, the affine version, so it's just the product over r greater than or equal to 0, indexed by the edges of, of gamma. So it's the thing, it's the cone over sigma. So sigma twiddle is the cone over sigma. And so this is going to be an affine integral. And this is not algebra geometric. So here we come with the exponential of these same fellows. Now there are no, uh, no exponents. It is the second semantic divided by uh, the first semantic uh, as a term in the exponential. And then I just take, as my uh, form of integration, I just take dTe over all the edges. And I have to divide by uh, the first semantic psi gamma to the <coughs> d over. So, I mean, the most interesting case is when d is 4 and then d over 2 is, uh, is 2. Okay, so this is sort of a toy path integral itself. You see, because what, what is this sigma, sigma twiddle? I have my graph gamma, so I use stupid graph gamma, and so sigma twiddle is the space, or I can think of as the space of metrics on gamma, right? It's just assigning a non-negative number to each edge with the possibility of degenerating to zero, okay? So this then becomes an integral over a space of metrics. Now, one of the typical versions of path integrals that occur uh, in quantum field theory is integration where the domain of integration is the space of paths, but not on a graph, but rather on an interesting Riemannian manifold. So here, this is kind of a toy version of uh, such, a <coughs> uh, such, a, such a thing. But OK. And um, so we want to do algebraic geometry. Uh, so of course, uh, we want to forget that guy and work with, with, uh, with one of the others, either one, two, or three. Uh, actually, no. In fact, the algebraic geometry uh, we want to do involves, involves this guy. So uh, let me go on. Now I have to tell you what, what these uh, polynomials or it's, it's kind of easy to say, and I, I'm short on time, so let me say it quickly. Um, if I have, I, I think of it in terms of configurations. So configuration, so I have some vector space, H, some finite dimensional vector space, which I think of as, um, is given as being inside a, it, it really doesn't matter, it, it, everything is algebra, so it doesn't matter, I just take a field K, and I put it inside some uh, vector space with a given basis, okay? And when I do that, then for each edge, I can project off onto the, uh, the corresponding uh, edge coordinate, and I write E dual also for the composition here. So E dual then becomes just a linear functional on H. And so E dual squared becomes a rank one uh, quadratic uh, form. Uh, quadratic form. And so it makes sense to look, I can think of it uh, if you like. Uh, I can think of E dual squared.
squared as a map, if I want to do it canonically, from h to h dual. And I can look at the sum uh, t e <laughs> times e dual squared. And I can cheat a little bit. I mean, it's, it's, there's a choice. I mean, if I look at the determinant of this expression, it's not quite well defined because sort of I have to fix a basis. Uh, but changing the basis doesn't change. See, I've put in these, these variables, and I really care about this thing uh, as, a, as a polynomial in these variables. So I will call this thing uh, psi of, of h. This is the first semantic, and it's well defined up to uh, a scale, up to scale. Um, and of course, the particular situation we're interested in is where h, I take h equals h1 of the graph, which sits inside, well, with, with k coefficients, and it sits inside k to the e, and so then I get uh, this then yields psi what I call psi gamma, which is a homogeneous polynomial in the, in the edge variables. Okay. Now, the second semantic is slightly trickier, but not much. If I look at the uh, h, uh, well, let me do it in, in general. I have h contained in k e, some labeled vector space. And let me write w. For the, for the quotient, and let me fix a, a section, call it tau here. So then, if I, I have h, and if I take a, if I, for any, for all w in w, I can look uh, at the, the vector space, not the vector space h, but the vector space h plus tau of little w, the line, I add on the line spanned by, uh, by that guy, and I can look at the, the polynomial I just constructed. Um, I guess this should be a subscript, so let me write this way. Let me write h sub w equals h plus the line spanned by tau w, and let me write uh, uh, phi of the te and uh, little w um, will be, by definition, psi of h sub w. OK, so it's a polynomial, then, which is of not of degree g. So remember, in the graph situation, h is a vector space of dimension g. So, but I've added on one line, so it actually has degree g plus 1. So, um, Next board. So the second semantic, uh, phi of, uh, I don't know what I, what I want to say, phi, which depends on the TE, the TE, but it also depends on, I should have called this something else, but let me, in, in the case of we're interested in it depends on the external momentum. So the, the, the quotient w here in our situation is the external space of external momentum. And so this is homogeneous of degree uh, g plus 1 uh, in the Te and uh, of degree 2 in external momentum. Now, there's a, a tricky point. Uh, I mean, it's not, not that tricky, but there's a, there's a point here. Um, for us, we want things to be uh, uh, in, in RD. We want to be in space-time. Uh, what I've described here is a kind of a, a linear. I mean, the P here is not in space-time anymore. Uh, so what we have to do is we have to couple psi, or phi, uh, to uh, rd with the 
uh, Minkowski metric. And basically, um, I'm not going to go through that in detail. Let me just say a word about how that works. If I have a matrix, um, uh, how does it, where does it go here? Um, yeah, if I have a, um, let's see if I can find the, I wrote it down here, yeah. If I had a matrix that looks like this, M, and here I have a W transpose, and here I have a W, and here I have an S, so this, this is um, G, and this is um, G plus 1, and similarly here is G, uh, and here is uh, g plus 1. So the w's are then row and column vectors, and s is just a, a scalar, just a one by one. Uh, then I can... Uh, symmetric. Uh, yeah, so this will be symmetric. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so uh, m symmetric. Then there is a classical formula for the determinant, so if I call the whole matrix, let's say, call it B, then the determinant of B is uh, something like this. And depending on the parity of the day I do the computation, there either is or is not a minus sign here. Um, w transpose, uh, I take the adjoint, the adjoint matrix of M, and I take S times the determinant of M. Or if I, I can write this differently, I can write this as determinant of B divided by determinant of M is equal to minus W transpose. And here I put M inverse, because I know that adjoint matrix divided by the determinant. Is it not quadratic in W? Yeah, it's usually quadratic in W. Sorry? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I left out. I left out. Sorry, sorry, sorry. There's, another, there's a W. There. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, w transpose M inverse W. Um, what am I trying to say? Yeah. Plus, plus S. Something like that. Um, now, notice, um, you see, what I can do, what I want to do is I want to couple W to um, this uh, space-time, right? And so I have to then reinterpret this uh, thing wherever I see. So this is going to be, uh, as Christoph points out, it's going to be quadratic in the entries of W. So wherever I see a quadratic expression in W, I replace it by the Minkowski quadratic form uh, on those two variables, OK? So from this point of view, it's kind of easy to see how to couple, so you want to couple the W to R D with the, with the Minkowski metric. And in that way, uh, using that uh, technology, you, you can get your second semantic, T, E, and P, to uh, work with P uh, um, in, well, in, in R D. R D indexed by the vertices comes here. Okay. And it's quadratic, so this thing is quadratic in P and of degree G plus 1 in T. So these are the two configuration polynomials, which are classic uh, and play a, a central role in the whole game. OK, so now um, the situation is that um, this. Uh, I started out there with a sort of generating series indexed by graphs. Uh, and this generating series comes from this sort of metaphorical object, which is the path integral. But that whole process is extremely unconvincing to mathematicians. It literally makes no sense at all. Um, and so that's in my, in my abstract, I talked about a sea of physics. So that's, that's the, the sea of physics. And the question is how to get across that sea without uh, indulging in 
uh, sort of fantasies that are difficult for a mathematician to understand. And I don't know the answer, but let me, uh, there is a su surprising uh, uh, game that can be played, and so I want to explain, <coughs> explain that. Okay, so this is the basic setup. Uh, now I, I want to move to the geometry. <coughs> Um, and the idea is going to be that our graph gamma, so we start with our graph gamma, but we interpret gamma as being the dual graph uh, to a, um, a, uh, a stable rational Uh, I've got to be a little careful. I, I, I need to assume maybe that the vertices are all at least, uh, have at least three edges. <laughs> so there's a small constraint on gamma to, to get stable. But that's, in fact, not a, not a big deal. In fact, you can, you can move beyond that. So let me remind you, this is, a, again, a familiar game, but let me remind you how to, how to play the game. Um, for each, um, let's see, how does it work? For each vertex in V gamma, we associate a Riemann sphere. So we take P1 index by V. Okay? And if, um, if we have an edge, uh, and the boundary of the edge is, let's say, uh, V and W, then we glue uh, P1 V and P1, W, at a point. Now, we have to be careful. I'm not claiming that there's a unique, uh, there's moduli here. If, if uh, a given vertex has four or more edges attached to it, then we will have um, four or more attachments to the corresponding P1, and so there will be moduli. So I don't claim that this is unique. But um, just do it somehow. And so this gluing gets us, uh, so this process yields a curve, uh, this stable uh, rational curve, which I call C0. So this yields C0. Is everyone familiar <coughs> with, with that game? So it's stable if and only if each point has at least three lines, right? Yeah, yeah. If it, if it doesn't have, I mean, but this is not, not a, uh, a real difficult issue. We can deal with semi-stable uh, situations as well. So uh, we can then look at diversal. We want to look at diversal deformation of this of this C naught. And as I say, C naught itself can have uh, can have moduli. So the picture that we get is something like this. Um, let's see, can everyone? I know there's a shadow effect. Uh, let's see if. Yeah. So the picture looks something like this. We have, and I want to think in the analytic character. So, so I'm drawing an, because I want to do topology. So I need some, uh, an algebraic geometer would tend to do formal things, but I want to work analytically. So we have a family then of curves. Uh, over a space S, and S contains a, a, a subvariety, a closed subvariety, which I call T, and then I can pull back CT. So we have uh, a thing like this. So um, let's see, S is, um, I don't know, it's open. Uh, it's essentially c to the 3g minus 3. Uh, and eventually, I'm going to add um, more parameters. So do I have a s plus some more parameters? Uh, but for the moment, you can just think of it as 3g. The more parameters, we're going to need, need to deal with marked curves. So this is going to be a family. family. 
And G is the genus of the, of the graph? G is always the genus of the graph, right. which is the same as the genus of the curve. I should have, I should have said that, in fact, uh, C naught, so uh, the dimension of H1 of C naught O C naught is G, and that's also the dimension of H1 C naught. Okay. Um, so what do I want to say? Yeah, so this is the, the so-called versal deformation. And uh, the T, there will be divisors. T will be an intersection of divisors, D, E. H1 and H1, uh, yeah, is G, which is the same. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Well, C naught as well. Capital N, you have the number of... Sorry? What is capital N? Ah, N, capital N, I'm going to tell you uh, in a while. This, this capital N, you mean? Yes. Yeah. That's going to account for, we're going to have to put punctures, uh, or not, uh, not punctures, we're going to have to look at marked curves. So these, these will be extra parameters for markings. Okay, but for the moment, we, we're not doing that. We're just understanding the geometry here. So the point is that T is itself an intersection of divisors. So these are divisors um, corresponding. So we can think of S as it's the versal deformation. So if we fix uh, a crossing point, and remember there's one crossing point for each edge. If we fix a point, crossing point and we look at deformations of the curve where that crossing point stays crossing, so to speak. Other crossing points can open up, but that one stays. That defines a divisor. So DE parameterizes deformations. Deformations, deformations, with um, the the, I didn't give it a name, but I should give it a, a name, let's say, with, with CE um, fixed, or let's say fixed, so the, the curve, other crossing points can open up, but this one stays fixed, um, then T is the intersection over all these divisors. This is a divisor because I'm just putting one constraint on my deformation. Okay. <clears throat> and all this is unobstructed uh, by the classical, because we're dealing with curves. Okay, so now um, let me draw a picture. Now we have to come up with a... Uh, well. So the, um, I'll draw a genus 2 picture, um, and my artistry is not very good, I apologize. Um, no, already I've messed up here. Maybe this one has to come down like that. And then I draw the same thing again here. No. Uh, shoot. <laughs> ah. I have difficulty. So imagine two sort of curious shaped objects kissing each other in three places. Okay? So this is C naught. And what is it, C naught? Well, it's a, uh, the graph uh, should have uh, three, um, let's see, two vertices. 
and three edges, right? So that one's easy to draw. Gamma is just this, okay, two vertices and three edges. But uh, when, I, when I look at the versatile deformation, I just, um, uh, it, becomes the, it becomes the usual genus two picture here. Right. And so what have I done? I've squeezed some vanishing cycles, that one and that one and that one. So these are vanishing cycles. Okay. And so what I've drawn here is C naught, and let's call this C, let's say S naught for some base point. So I'll take a base point in here, uh, which is a, which is a, away from. So S naught is not S naught is not in any of the in any of the, the divisors. So it corresponds to a curve with no singularities. Okay, and then. Um, I degenerate. All right? So that's a classical, well understood picture. And some remarks. First of all, we have a specialization map, which we call SP, from the homology of the, uh, the general fellow, so we call it CS0, that's the smooth curve, say with rational coefficients, to uh, the homology of the singular. And it's it's surjective. Okay, that's that's first of all the existence of such a map is classical. It amounts to the statement that in the fibers here, if I take my singular fellow, I can always find a tubular neighborhood which is a deformation retract, and then I can imagine my smooth guy living in that neighborhood. So I can map the homology of the smooth guy to the homology of the neighborhood. And then via the deformation rate retract, it maps to the homology of the special fiber. So that's a classical uh, game. And the fact that it's symmetric, you can just see it. Because you, you're looking at closed paths in here. And they lift uh, to closed paths, to paths here, which, which end at the vanishing cycle. But then I can just go around the vanishing cycle a little bit. And it just amounts to saying the vanishing cycles are connected. Easy to see that it's a surjection. Okay. Now, um, if I the second fact, so this is the first fact that it's a surjection. The second fact, if I if I write a to be the kernel of the specialization, so that's the space spanned by the the vanishing cycles. Notice the vanishing cycles are not linearly independent. Because when, when we have two, uh, two irreducible components, we get a relation between the vanishing cycles. So the vanishing cycles are not linearly independent. Here, there are three of them. Um, but I, the A is the space spanned by those. Um, and the assertion is, uh, what's the assertion? That A is, the, is a maximal isotropic subspace of h1, or h lower 1, of cs. Okay. Now there you, you have to think a little bit. Uh, you have to convince yourself, first of all, it's isotropic, because if I get close enough to here, then the vanishing cycles are going to be forcibly separate from each other, because they, they live in little neighborhoods of the, the points, and the points are separate. <laughs> So the, the vanishing cycles are, are clearly separate from each other, which means uh, that the pairing between two of them will always be zero. Um, and the fact that it's maximal isotropic just simply becomes, because this is surjective, and this has dimension g, and this has dimension 2g, then a has dimension g. Okay, so the reason is that just the dimension of a is equal to g by 1. That you see on the first H one, 
Say again? The, the quadratic form, which is... Uh, it's just the, 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 just the intersection, uh, the alternating, it's an alternating form on h lower one of the, of the curve. It is physically just intersection, yes, with, with orientation. Uh, so uh, let's, I still have enough time, I think. Um, yeah. So I now want to talk about the uh, picard lefschetz transformation. So 3 is uh, picard lefschetz And the picard lefschetz uh, is, is like this. Um, if I write uh, A, E for the vanishing cycle, associated to E in E, remember that these guys index the, the, uh, the, the points here, the, the bad points, the singular points. <clears throat> and so for each of those, I have a, a, a circle that is contracting to it. So that gives me the vanishing cycle, which I call AE. <clears throat> then the picard uh says that if I look at the effect on the homology uh, I get by winding around, so if I wind around DE, the divisor DE, associated to that particular E, then what happens is a general one cycle B goes to B, uh, and there's an issue of orientation, but let me say plus um, B the intersection of B with, with AE, AE times AE. There's an issue. Uh, you've got to get the sign right. Is it minus? Luke says minus. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> also, there is also a convention of pi 1 of the, of the yeah. circle. Yeah, I mean, we have to figure out which way we're winding here. Yeah, so, so it's really a... It doesn't, I mean, it, it's not an important point. So I'll, uh, <clears throat> okay, um, so uh, this is a classical familiar uh, fact. <clears throat> so uh, if I call this transformation, let's, let me call this uh, Le of, uh, of B, so the linear form, then we know that Ne, which is Le minus the identity, uh, <clears throat> which is also the log of Le, and it just sends, so Ne of B is just the, the intersection number Be, Bae times Ae. So this is all, again, familiar uh, stuff. <clears throat> and the nilpotent orbit, the can use a black hole on the right. There's one more black hole. Yeah, but somehow I'm into the logic of putting it on the big, big blackboard here. So let's see if I can do it without, without covering anything up here. If I bring this one down, let's see if this works. Then, <clears throat> then the nilpotent orbit, so the nilpotent orbit. It's just the collection of all endomorphisms <coughs> of the form uh, sum over the edges, um, TE, so some real uh, <coughs> non negative real uh, constant, times this NE. And so we can maybe call this N. It's just a collection of all these things. And it's easy to see that, in fact, n, n is nilpotent. <coughs> okay, 
It's not perhaps quite obvious, but you have to think about it a little bit. Each of the NEs are, I mean, not just nilpotent, it's, it's in fact square zero. Uh, but I mean, uh, it's a square zero? I'm confused. It's certainly nilpotent. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, it's, it's certainly no problem. Let me let me not get in trouble. It's kind of product of the different. Uh... Yeah, because you see the physically again, it's this issue that uh, because the the vanishing cycles are all physically disjoint, they don't. Uh, if I apply the, the so okay. the product of different ends is zero. So the product of different ends is zero. So it's actually square zero. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's the kind of thing that's difficult to think when you're. On your is our period also on which space? Yeah, this is, a, this is exactly the point I was, I'm, I'm glad you said that, because this is exactly the point I was going to say. These are nilpotent as endomorphisms of H1 of the smooth CS0. Okay? But there's another way you can think about these things, which is to, as follows, you can write H1 of the graph, um, that is the same as H1 of the singular curve, C0, and that's isomorphic to H1 of the smooth curve modulo this A, which remember was the maximal isotropic subspace spanned by the vanishing cycles, and NE, any one of these NEs, kills all of A, so it, it gives a map from this quotient and of course, the, the image is, is A, which is isomorphic to H1 of C S modulo A dual. All right, I mean, I, I don't claim these things are maybe spring to mind, but this is then isomorphic to H1 of gamma dual. Okay, so for each edge then, we get a, um, a map from this uh, g-dimensional vector space to its dual. That is, we get a quadratic form. And uh, the, the nice fact, which is not hard, but it's a little exercise, so I call it a proposition, is that this n e is equal to, and I think I screwed up by not giving it a name, uh, is equal to Me, which was, so remember I had H1 of gamma um, inside, um, let's say, R, the edges of gamma. And then for each edge, I could project to R, and this gave me an, uh, a functional that I call E dual, and Me, was associated, was simply the, associated to the quadrat form E dual squared. And the proposition is that this, that this uh, symmetric, I mean, well, you can think of it as a symmetric matrix or a quadratic form, uh, is the same as this one that comes from the geometry. It's not hard, but it takes a little, little effort. Okay, so um, with that in mind, uh, we want to relate the first and second semantic polynomials, which came out of just an abstract discussion of the gra graph, the linear algebra associated to the graph, to the limits of heights on these family of curves. Now, to talk about heights, we need to, oh my god, we're out of time. So uh, I'm going to go five minutes over uh, with the chairman. Uh, OK, the chairman can, can start his watch. Okay. So uh, I need to talk about heights. So let me at least uh, say enough to, to make the, the statement. Um, so I consider now, uh, let me draw the picture. That may be, may be a good way to do here. So here is, is my space S. Here is uh, the, the bad fiber, and here is this this here is C naught, the singular curve. And so then here is a smooth curve. This is the point S naught. So what I want to do, say again? About, about a zero, it's disconnected? Uh, no, no, no. 
No, no, it, 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 it's, no, no, it's, it's, uh, it's connected. Um, so above, so I want to add, add parameters. Uh, and when I add parameters, that will enable me to enrich the picture by adding some sections. So I will add some sections here. So these are sections. So I have sections. So sections. I don't know what do we call sections? Let's say uh, mu. Mu i. Okay. And then I control very carefully how the sections um, meet uh, at infinity. Okay. So what what data do I have here? Suppose that this section meets this component. Well, this component, remember, is, remember the components are indexed by the vertices. So this is the V component. So for V, a vertex of gamma. So what I do is two things. I I want to get, I want to deduce from this collection of sections, which I think of as a family of zero cycles, uh, in fact I think of as two families of zero cycles, I want to um, deduce uh, external momenta at infinity. Now external momenta are linear combinations of the vertices with coefficients in Rd. Okay. So what I have to do in the first instance is I have to couple these sections to the vector space Rd. So I couple the sections to Rd. Now what does that mean? It doesn't make any sense. But what I'm interested in is the height. So I write down a sum. I don't know what that was, but whatever it was, it's gone, gone forever. Um, I write down the height, which is a sum R V, um, uh, let's call it mu, uh, mu, uh, what do I want to say? R I, let's say, mu I, where the mu I's are the, the sections. So let me call this, let's say, A, and I'll take another one, let's say, R I prime, or rj prime mu j, and I'll call this, let's say, a prime. And I look at the height, which is uh, a and a prime. And because I want these things to yield um, external momenta, I have a constraint that the sum of the ri's should be 0. And similarly here, the sum of the rj primes equals 0, which is perfect because to talk about a height, I need to talk about zero cycles of degree 0. So I don't have time to explain this idea of coupling to a vector space, but it's not hard. Once you know how to define heights, you, you, it's easy to see how to couple it to a vector space. And then the theorem. What sort of are you talking about? Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, is it some sort of arithmetic thing? But yes, I mean, it, it is the... Or no, 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 no. This is, a, this, is a, this is the height of, if I have two zero cycles of degree zero, which are disjoint, I have always defined. Essentially, you can compute it by taking differential forms with log poles on A and integrating over yeah. chains here. So this is the classical uh, height. I'm sorry, I did my time badly. But the theorem is going to be that the, um, if we look back, and if I preserved it, and I didn't, uh, that the um, E exponential of I psi uh, phi over psi is the limit um, as a certain parameter alpha naught, which I, I, I didn't really have time to explain, as alpha naught goes to 0, uh, which essentially amounts to saying, if we look at the structure 
of the base S. So the base S we can think of as a product of copies of GM, so like punctured disks. And if we imagine the parameters as all going to zero, then this, this is what this alpha naught is saying. Uh, then this exponential here is a limit of exponential of i height a a prime, where a and a prime are both zero cycles corresponding to the given external momentum here. So this is a function of external momentum. So a and a prime are zero cycles corresponding to a given p in the sense that I explained. That is, they say they cross the right vertices with the right uh, <coughs> uh, values of uh, the space-time uh, at those points. So the bottom line is then that the, um, the, the term that occurs in the amplitude is a limit of heights. Now, um, say again? Alpha zero. Yeah. So alpha zero is measuring, I, I don't really have time to go into detail, but alpha zero is measuring how we are approaching um, uh, the, the, the t. So remember, we have s and we have t. So I'm thinking of s minus t as being something like a product of punctured disks. And alpha zero is measuring how fast we are approaching the punctures. It's a divisor of normal crossings. It's, yeah, it's a divisor of normal crossings, and we are approaching simultaneously all the, all the parameters at, at, a, at a given speed. Um, I'm sorry, I, this is on the web and, and uh, in, in archives, so you can get the details. But I think I'd better stop. So uh, when you have this multi section, this several sections, so you, they cut each uh, each uh, component in certain. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And what is the relation of this to what you explained? For those numbers are related to how they are related to what you have. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. They are. Um, let me just say a word about that. Um, is it okay? I put it over here. Um, the remember. Everything is a function of the external momenta, which are in um, R, D, V, 0. Okay? And V indexes the, the, the P1 Vs, the components. Okay? So for each V, for each little V, in V, um, I give myself a, a section, okay? So I have a, a section, let's call it mu sub V, um, and this section meets um, P V, but, it's, but, but that's it, it just meets P V, okay? So it's, it's, it's this guy. But you have drawn several ones that meet. Yes, because, yeah, that's a good point. I, and again, I, I'm sorry I ran out of time. Um, there, there's a technical point about the height, which we need to assume that the, um, the zero cycles in question are disjoint. Right? So what I would like to write is A, A. But that doesn't make any sense. So what I do is I take an, an A prime, which is also meets there with the same with the same thing. So that's the that's the idea. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pierre. Ask a very naive question. So what is the relation between the height and the green function? Because normally the way I would think about it is that I would have punctures on a Riemann surface. Uh, between two punctures I will have the green function. Yes. And then I will take the degeneration limit the way you design. Yeah. I mean roughly speaking they, they are the same. They are the same. The height is the Green's function. Um, there are, in fact, um, I, I like to think of it in terms of heights because the, the philosophy here, what the, what the mathematician wants to inject, 
are these height structures. And the heights are uh, typical examples of real valued functions associated to variations of height structure. So this should be a, a, a general game. When we have a degenerating variation of height structure, we should be able to get interesting amplitudes as integrals over the nilpotent orbit uh, associated to this, this variation. So that's, that's the idea. But you're right. I mean, it, that's why I say that you guys knew this. But you maybe didn't think of it from the point of view of variations of height structure. That's, that's and you always need one parameter, alpha zero? Yes. Um, you don't want, yeah, this is uh, actually, Professor Kato can be more precise about this than I can. But uh, you, you don't want to let the various uh, edges go at different speeds. Because then that way it can be, if you, if you choose the, the different speeds badly, you can get, uh, the limit can be not what you want. But that's interesting because that's precisely what string phase is telling you, alpha zero is alpha prime. So yeah, al sorry, I should have called it in fact alpha prime. Yeah, I should have called it alpha prime. It is, it is measuring the, the, the approach. We're proving that string phase has only one dimension full parameter that is needed. Um, sense, I mean, it's, uh, the fact that you need one parameter is very striking. I, I'm still working with the box. I mean, I... Any <laughs> question? Uh, uh, if instead of this big dimensional edge, you induce to one dimensional situation. Yeah. So you have this map, so it's moved to, yeah, from, from gamma to... Uh, yeah. Well, it's not. I mean, it's a rank one. Uh, on the, on the one dimension, yes, you get a curve with semi-stable reduction. Yes. Yeah. And this what you get is just what's importantly called the uh, monotony pairing. Yeah. So uh, here you work in the Q coefficient. Yeah. Uh, what then this looks at um, more. Uh, uh, Closely at the, the integral part. Mm -hmm. So then you have an isogeny. Mm -hmm. So the co kernel of this map mm -hmm. is exactly the um, group of connected components uh, the of the spatial yeah. fiber yeah. of the neural model. Yes. So I wonder if this yeah. enters into your, your picture. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet, but. Uh, um... And also, I should say, um, coming to heights. Mm -hmm. So, what do you have to conjecture that uh, you have more generally an abelian variety A and mm -hmm. uh, A is not the same, yeah? And it's mm -hmm. pure A prime, so you have the, the pairing be between those <coughs> two, two connected components. So, mm -hmm. two, uh, an abelian variety, uh, semi stable mm -hmm. reduction. So, you have this pairing, and you conjecture that the pairing is perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, this was proven uh, recently by, I think, a student of uh, Cato. Mm -hmm. And but uh, previously there was some work of Bosch, mm -hmm. and uh, Bosch considered uh, so proved it in some cases, mm -hmm. and precisely using uh, height mm -hmm. bearings. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. I wonder uh, how this. Uh, well, let me just say that those those, those <laughs> here uh, appear, they also appeared in, in the in I think. But uh, yeah, so mm -hmm. I wonder if the. the this story, this final story, has any significance to or relevance? We have to ask the ask the physicist. Uh, from my my point of view, uh, I notice just one one remark that is suggested by what you said that this is uh, absolutely the most degenerate. We're going to the the worst place. Uh, why why should physics be preoccupied with the worst worst place? Is there, is there any physics to be found by just degenerating uh, a little bit? Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and uh, so uh, uh, there's lots of possibility for interplay between the math and the physics. Mm -hmm. uh, but just to record any proof that the one dimensional situation, the different equations. Mm -hmm. Well, here we need, we need the, notice we need the higher dimensional situation because we need ultimately our integral yeah. is going to be over the full nilpotent orbit. Not not just over one one yeah. one guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But already one dimension, which is quite fascinating. Okay. 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 Uh, two quick questions. Uh, two quick questions. Uh -huh. First, uh, was it about massless? Uh, yes. Yes. I'm sorry. I should have said this is all massless. But it's a nice it's a nice question. What happens if we put masses in? I haven't thought. Mm -hmm. And second, uh, have you done or can you make a version of this for? 
open strings when you have oriented Feynman graphs and you replace vertices by disks and uh, edges by strips. Edges by strips. strips. Yes. Well, that's open string theory. I mean, muscles limit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I could repeat, but I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure it would be correct. Uh, uh, not by me, in any case. Uh, yeah, not by my group. Uh, I'm sorry, why, why you said it's a good thing the real plus money doesn't appear? Is that because it gets rid of all these intervals entirely? Was our senior Akani saying? Well, Akani said a lot of things. Uh, um, uh, let me, I mean, let's just say that the chain of integration is replaced by uh, irreducible components of the real Grassmannian. <coughs> End of story. Uh, for me, I mean, I, I can't go further than that. So we sign just quicker again?